Three years ago now, I had about four years clean, and I finally thought I had a beat. I had a job where I was making 25 an hour. I had a three-bedroom apartment in Staten Island, a beautiful fiance. I was taking care of her nine-year-old daughter, and you know, I thought I had it. And all it took was one bad day of work, having a, a, a helper in my van that just so happened to be a coke dealer. Ah, what's one bag gonna do to me? It's been three years, I deserve one bag. And that was the worst move I ever made. What took me four years to get, I lost in a matter of six months. To my fiance, my job, my three bedroom apartment, my car, everything I killed myself to get, I lost like this. It's so easy to fall, it's so hard to get up. If I wasn't told about this place, I, I, I wouldn't be here today. I really wouldn't. I, I, I wouldn't be alive, they, they saved my life. We opened our peer model, overdose prevention center, safe consumption site, where people get to come in and use safely. And if there's an overdose, we get to respond and keep them alive. They get to be loved on, they get to be treated as humans. The OPC is one program within many services we offer. So they're coming in and having healthy meals. They're having mental health services, case management services, support with housing, an array of services that truly speak to their needs in a way they never experienced. I'm really excited to show you our Washington Heights location, which houses our consumer-led overdose prevention center. Come on in. This is our syringe service desk. This is kind of the heart of the program, so when people come up, they touch down here to figure out which program spaces they want to head into. We have the overdose prevention center on this side, and then we have the respite and hygiene program in the lounge over here. The population in Washington Heights is very, very street entrenched. They're mostly encampment dwelling, living in the subways or camps in the parks. So providing them a place to sleep and a comfortable place to chill is a really big part of this program. Demand in this room really changes depending on the weather and policing patterns and other factors in the neighborhood. So we have, we've just started building a holistic space here. We're gonna have bees and a big garden on the roof here as well. That will be happening in partnership with some of the schools. So we're gonna grow food together and then serve it back to the community. What we know and what we've experienced uh, coming up on a year now is the impact it has in the community. This park alone, 13,000 syringes collected a month, is down to a thousand, is, is getting lower from there. That's community impact. The amount of money we save these communities. On average, during an overdose, when the New York City Fire Department, Police Department, Ambulance, EMS has to respond, it's about $30,000. We've had close to 600 overdose interventions. Just quick basic math is over 15 million, $16 million in savings. People will say it's gonna be crowded. You're gonna bring all these drug dealers. You're going to bring lines of people outside. It's quite the opposite. The folks who were using in public, the folks who were leaving paraphernalia in front of schools are no longer doing that. Before the OPC opened, users used to be in each corner of this park. Nobody else was able to use the park because they were scared to come in here. But now that the OPC is open, we have them come upstairs, they're able to use upstairs safely. We have food upstairs, we have TV upstairs, we have coffee upstairs, and the park is, is being utilized by other people these days. Here's one of our outreach vehicles pulling up that's out in Washington Heights on a day-to-day -day basis doing syringe litter cleanup, connecting with the community, working with the schools that are just a block and a half away from us. So we're there every morning doing syringe litter cleanup, working with the parents and the principals, integrating with the community, and through that work, we now host interns from their senior class who want to get into public health, who want to get into medicine, who want to get into nursing, who want to get into addiction treatment, and they're here with us uh, on the ground with our team working in our center. So having us here, you know, it benefits both the community and the people that we serve each and every day. Allison, can I ask you like uh, three more 27s, please? Thank you. If I wasn't using here, I'd probably be using on the street somewhere or in the train stations. Yeah, I'd be either in the park, in the train station, in the street, which is not really good because kids could see you doing things like that. And we got to protect our kids, man. They're the future. How long have you been using drugs? Wow, since I was like 14, and I'm 54 now. Well, I've been smoking marijuana, honestly, since the age of nine years old. I started hard drugs at the age of 18. 
My mom committed suicide and I um, kind of spiraled out of control. Since then, it's been a, a back and forth battle. I just turned 38. Never in my life would I thought that I'd be using a drug so I wouldn't get sick and I'd just be normal. I always talk down on people and they used to tell me, oh, I'm sick, I need help. And I would be, I'd lay, I'll get off your ass and go make some money, it's not that bad. When I got addicted and I got sick for the first time, I felt like the biggest idiots and I ate my words big time, boy. It's, it's, it's another world, this drug. It's like it really is. And it's a revolving door every day, day in, day out. You ha it's like you can't take a day off. You have to wake up, you have to go make money because if you don't make money, you're going to get sick. And if you get sick, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. I've actually completed two treatments on two TCs. When I left them, you know, I had a couple years of sobriety and I would eventually have a bad day and that bad day would result to one bag of coke and that one bag of coke would be a couple bags of coke a day and then I'd be too high one day to go home and I'd have to get a bag of dope to come down and I'd be re to the dope again. If we could quit like that, we, we would have did it. Nobody wants to be an addict. Nobody wants to live like an addict. I'm still an addict because I don't really know how to, how to stop. You know, I, I, I try, but it's just I can't. I, I really would like to stop because I really, uh, my mother's 80 years old. She just had her birthday. All her kids was there, and I couldn't be there because of the, the habit. She's 80 years old, and she got nine kids, and I'm the middle one, and I love them all. And they love me, but I... I push them away because I don't want to get them involved with my life. I see what happens in the future. I see a lot of good things happening if I stop. A lot of beautiful things happening if I stop. When you're on the streets trying to get sober, it makes it 10 times harder because you have no support. You have no roof over your head every night. Let's just say you want to get a job. Who's going to hire you? You go to work stinking every day. Getting clean on the streets is like nearly almost impossible. 90% of the time, if I'm on the streets getting high and I fall out from a shot and I'm ODing, somebody's just going to think I'm sleeping or something like that. They're not going to know the difference. You know, they're going to think, you know, it's nothing, nothing big. It's just a homeless guy on the street sleeping. Meanwhile, I'm ODing and I'm on my way to death. The fact that I can do it here. This place is it got sent for us. The computer, the TV room, the bathrooms. As soon as they see the symptoms of overdose, they, they right there, they really save lives. You know, we have our crash cars, we have all our life-saving equipment here. What you're not gonna have if you're sitting out in the park or in the basement of a building or wherever, you know, people choose to use. We love our people, so we're on top of them, we're watching. We don't want anything to happen to any of our people while they're with us. So once we sit them at the table, we get them the supplies, and um, basically we leave them to do what they do, monitor them through the mirrors. Sometimes we can see without always being up in somebody's face. And while they're doing their thing, you sit, you talk, you get some, some conversation going. A lot of times you can come in, not even make it upstairs, and somebody says, Yo, listen, I'm ready to go to a program. They may want to go to detox. The conversation opens the door to something else. It happens here a lot because we already have those relationships built with our people. We have a lot of employees here that have lived experiences. So certain things that one person may not understand about how someone's feeling, they can relate. So the peer or consumer-led model, it really at its heart is a caring person with some training overseeing somebody who is consuming drugs. And the funny thing about it, they never took a course or, or went to school or nothing. But they learned, they learned from their own self from being here and seeing things. Because the best teacher is experience. If we are serious about inviting people back into society, one of the biggest ways that you can do that is giving people employment with fair and decent living wages. So we hire very heavily from our participant base to allow a slow stabilization and a slow learning of new skills and a slow integration into employment with On Point NYC on people's own timeline. We have hired people from the overdose prevention centers directly, people that have had overdose experiences with us who post overdose have said, I want to try something different. And we say, would you like a job interview? They have not died. They have received beautiful care from their peers and they've been supported to make changes in their lives, not necessarily around their addiction, 
but around other aspects and other goals that they have in their lives. Yes, of course, addiction treatment. Yes, buprenorphine. Yes, mental health and medical care. But what else do you want for yourself and how can we help you achieve those goals as well? I've been working for On Point for the last four years and I enjoy getting up in the morning to come to work because I know that I'm gonna make a difference in somebody's life. I was using heroin for about four years. So I found out about On Point. I had the opportunity to um, become an employee, participant first, peer, now staff. I would get up in the morning, do two bags, come to work, meaning getting straight. I would come to work, I would do my job, lunchtime, do another two bags, and that would hold me for the time at work. I recently stopped using, I had a fatal overdose, and it kind of what you want to call scared me straight. I overdosed and kept my job, and that's harm reduction. I don't think any other job would let somebody keep their job at that point. The fact is that some of them are still actively using and some of them are recovering addicts, but they've been there before, so they can relate to you and they don't judge you. There is no judgment here. And so I started out as a peer and, you know, I, I, I was still in, in, indulging, using. After a while, when you start seeing that you're doing good within the program and everybody um, that you're helping, they just like thanking you and, and you being a part of the solution and not the problem. I think that's what motivated me to want to change my life and want to do better. I'm grateful for this place. On Point definitely saved my life. I'll be in the street looking for my next fix. There were people using drugs who, who are self-medicating pain, who are self-medicating trauma, beautiful, kind-hearted, loving people that we now get to work with in our centers. Um, I started using when I was 15, heroin. And uh, I got sober at 45, but through the years I was homeless, went to jails, in prisons, the whole nine. Uh, in 2015, I had a couple of friends die from overdoses, and uh, I wound up going to a detox, to a rehab, and then started going to meetings, and I still continue to go today. Um, working here, for me, helps me, especially working the door, because I see like 200 people a day that are just like me and uh, it feels good to help other people. Um, and it also reminds me of who I am each and every day. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to go back to where I was. Want your job? Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. At first I wanted to actually go at Nairi and then I'm like, what am I thinking about? Like, I'll be held accountable up here. Like, people don't even recognize me. I don't recognize you, it's amazing. It's amazing. I can't believe the two of you. How was your husband too? Yes, right. interview next week. Yeah. Okay. The city wanted to open four sites, and within those four sites, they wanted to have 130 overdose interventions. We have two sites. We're at month 11, and we have 570 overdose interventions. <laughs> we have 2,000 individuals using the site. 2,000 individuals who are not using out here, who are not negatively impacting the community. And of those 2,000 people, we have almost 42,000 utilizations. And it's not just a place to come get high. They have a drop-in center here. They have, put, they have staff that help you get your, your benefits. They help you get housing. You know what I mean? This is not just a place to come and just get high safety, but this place is more than what anybody thinks. This place needs to be everywhere in the world that has drug problems. We're not open 24 hours yet, we will be. Join me in looking forward to what it's going to look like when we're 24 hours. The impact is going to have in the community. My favorite data point is zero, zero deaths. And my favorite compliment is, we forgot you were open. <laughs> <laughs>